Good morning, students, wherever you are. And welcome to this new normal where we're having some of our lectures online. Um, this is the second and final lecture of your introduction to African studies. And the topic that we'll deal with today is the political geography of Africa and perspectives of African culture. Our objectives for today's lecture will be to give you a general overview of African political, social and cultural systems. And under that, give you specific overview of the following concepts. African culture or African cultures, development, and then we will critique some existing notions of these concepts. And then finally, establish and explain the relationship between culture and development. First of all, let's ask the question, what is meant by political geography of Africa? The political geography of Africa accounts for the physical and conceptual presence of Africa and African cultures, political systems and values across entire time and space. To elaborate further, the physical means or refers to what the map of Africa represents, that is the land mass, its people, traditions, and the political institutions. Then the physical refers to how Africa is divided regionally into sub-Saharan Africa and North of Africa. And when we say North of Africa, we are referring largely to the Maghreb. The conceptual can be explained as Africa's presence through its people, cultures, traditions, and practices, both on the continent and in the diaspora. African diaspora will include Africans who live in Europe, in the Caribbean, North America, and South America, the Pacific Islands, India, and Asia. When we talk of time and space, we will refer to the historical and contemporary expansion of Africa, its values, political and religious systems in the diaspora and on the continent. Now, having explained this to you, let us look at some important facts about Africa. Africa is the second largest continent after Asia. It has a land mass which includes lakes, rivers, mountains, and so on, of a little over 11.7 million kilometers square. Continental Africa stretches for about 5,000 miles from Cape Town in the south to Cairo in the north, and about 3,000 miles from Dakar in the west to Mogadishu in the east. It has a population of about 1.32 billion who live in Africa as at 2019. We continue with the important facts about Africa. Continental Africa is about the size of USA, Argentina, Europe, India, China, and New Zealand combined or about three and a half times the size of the USA. Africa has 54 recognized states, including island republics off its coasts. Most African states are multilingual. They speak different languages, but we have exceptions such as Somalia, Swaziland, Lesotho, Rwanda, and Botswana. And when we're talking about multilingual, for example, Nigeria has over 500 languages, while Kenya has over 100 languages. Again, we would say Africa is a cradle of humanity. The first humans, that is Homo sapiens, lived on the African soil. 
But there's also a very interesting quotation from Professor Ali Mazuri in his book, The African Condition, A Political Prognosis, um, published in London by Heinemann in 1980. And here, Professor Mazuri says, makes this interesting quotation about Africa and says that, and I quote, Africa is the habitat of man, but it is the last to be made habitable. Africans are not the most brutalized of all people, but probably the most humiliated in modern history. African societies are not the closest to the West culturally, but been experiencing the most rapid pace of Westernization. He continues to say, Africa is not the poorest of all the regions of the world in resources, but it is the least developed of the inhabited continents. Africa is not the smallest of the continents, but it is probably the most fragmented. And Africa is the most central of all continents in geographical location, but politically to some extent, militarily, it is the most marginal. So this is very exciting, and I, I think this can stimulate some discussion amongst you and in your forum about some of these contradictions um, about Africa and whether the situation is still the same or it has changed. But let's move on to another topic or another major conference that took place in Berlin between 1884 and 1885, which we have properly come to call um, the Berlin Conference. And then in this Berlin Conference, some European countries, including England, including France, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, they met to decide the future of Africa and how to share the lands of Africa amongst these Europeans who had gathered there. The result was that Africa was partitioned and Europeans took hold of certain parts of African land. Great Britain desired to have from Cape in the south to Cairo in the north, being a collection of colonies. And in fact, they almost succeeded in doing this. They got Egypt, they got Sudan, which was then known as Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. They took Uganda, Kenya, which was also known as British East Africa, South Africa, and Zambia, Zimbabwe, which was then known as Rhodesia, and Botswana. In West Africa, Britain also controlled Nigeria and Ghana, which was known as Gold Coast, and then Sierra Leone and Gambia. France took much of Western Africa from Mauritania to Chad, and Chad was previously known as French West Africa, and Gabon and the Republic of Congo, which was also known as French Equatorial Africa. Belgium and its king, Leopold II, controlled the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now we simplify and say Congo, um, DRC, formerly the Belgian Congo. The Portuguese took Mozambique in the east and Angola in the west. Italy's holdings included Somalia, which was previously known as Italian Somali Somaliland, and a portion of Ethiopia. Germany took Namibia, that is German Southwest Africa. Tanzania, which was also known as German East Africa, Togo, and Cameroon. Also initially, the Germans took Rwanda and Burundi until the G Belgians claimed it after World War I. Spain claimed Spanish Sahara and Equatorial Guinea, one of the smallest territories in Africa. So you will see on the slide what Africa looked like after the partitioning of the continent between the years 1884 and 1885. You will see from your slides how the continent was partitioned after this big conference. And then to the right, you see 
what Africa looks now after all the countries have gained independence. Let's move to the next slide. And let's look at one important topic which many African countries and the Africans in the diaspora have been working towards to achieve a continental unity of all Africans, and not only on the continent, but across the diaspora. And this is Pan-Africanism and the Pan-African movement. Let me ask you, do you know what Pan-Africanism is? What is Pan-Africanism? Where did it start? Who were the leaders? And so on. Is it a movement, a notion, or an idea? Before we go on to explain what it is and who some of the leading fathers of Pan-Africanism is, there is a perception by some Africans, continentally and abroad, that Africans share a common origin, history, destiny, and interests as a people of African descent usually expressed as unification economically and politically. Pan-Africanism in its modern form is undoubtedly the result of slavery and colonization in Africa. As a sociopolitical movement, it can be traced to the first African conference of July 1900 in London. The conference was convened by Henry Sylvester Williams and the African Association, which Williams founded in 1898. The conference set up the Pan-African Association, abbreviated as PAA, which later metamorphosed into the Pan-African movement. What are the goals? of the Pan-African movement. One was to create a United States of Africa, which should include the Caribbean countries. The second, to ensure closer ties between the peoples of African descent and the world over. Three, to bring about friendlier relations between the peoples of African descent and other races. And four, to secure the civil rights of all Africans in the world. And lastly, to promote African businesses to commerce globally. Now, who are some of the leaders of the Pan-African movement? I will just give you a list of some of them. And I would be very happy to see some of you Google and find a bit about the biography of these leaders of the Pan-African movement. They include H.S. Williams, which I have mentioned earlier, W.E. Dubois, who was the father of Pan-Africanism, Marcus Garvey, George Padmore, Kwame Nkrumah, Haley Selassie, Sheikh Anta Diop, Julius Nyerere, and Malcolm X. What are the legacies of all these great men who worked so hard to bring together Africans on the continent and in the diaspora? What did they achieve? Did they achieve anything? Or was it a complete failure? Or just meeting at conferences and talking without results? Let me just go through a few of the successes or the legacies of the Pan-African movement. What it did first was that it led to the independence of many African and Caribbean countries. Second, it led, it led to the formation of the Organization of African Unity, now called African Union. It advocated for global rights for people of African descent. And then it encouraged the studies of Africa, which we now call African studies, or Afrocentrism, and so on. But it's interesting to note that at this stage, no United States of Africa has yet been achieved. But there is the ACP, African 
Caribbean and Pacific group of states. Having wrapped that up, let us come to some major occurrence that took place in 2019, which many of us heard and some of us participated, called the commemoration of the year of return. 2019 was marked as a year of return of the Africans on the continent and in the diaspora. And why was it 2019 chosen as the year to mark the return of Africans? Here is a background. The history tells us that the enslavement and transshipment of Africa across the Atlantic dates back to the 14th century. However, first African recorded to have landed in English colony in Jamestown, Virginia, as set of a ride on August 20th, 1619. It is on record that 20, in quotes, 20 odd Negroes were the hapless victims of this landing. They originated from Angola. And these slaves were stolen from a Portuguese slave ship, then transported to an English warship flying a Dutch flag, and eventually sold to colonial settlers. 2019 is thus the 400th year of the recorded landing of enslaved Africans, or the African-American representatives. The U.S. Congress of the United States of America passed a bill titled H.R. 1242, 400 Years of African-American History Commission Act. The Black Congressional Caucus, accompanied by the Speaker of Congress, visited Ghana in July 2019 to commemorate this ignominious moment in U.S. history. Some people of the African descent, however, have struggled to get back. Um, the classic case being the Maroons of Suriname and so on. So these were some of the challenges of the celebration. Now, a number of reasons can be advanced why Ghana and why 2019 was declared as the year of return. First, the territories of Ghana once harbored the transatlantic slave trade, which must be unreservedly condemned. And so this is referred to as the hub. That Ghana is the first sub-Saharan country to gain independence from colonialism, and has from its inception been at the forefront of promoting Pan-Africanism in Africa. So we say Ghana is a standard bearer. A large number of members of the African diaspora had determined that 2019 would be an appropriate year to make a pilgrimage back to the African continent and to trace the ancestry. Thus, Ghana was chosen as pilgrimage destination. The year therefore presented a unique opportunity for Ghana to renew its engagement with a global African community for sustained, mutually beneficial, and long-term cooperation. Year-long events planned included homecoming, Panafest, and Emancipation Day. Let me ask you a few questions, and I do expect you to give me the answers to these questions now. But I expect you to engage, actively engage in discussing this, these questions during the forum or your forum. What do people in your society understand by culture? And these discussions are going to form the beginning of the next few slides where we're going to discuss African culture. What do you understand by culture? Do African languages have a word for culture? Think about them critically and in the next session in your forum, you will discuss these. Now, after you've discussed these, I will move on to 
engage you in some definitions of culture. Many scholars and thinkers have advanced definitions for culture. One writer, for example, that we'll look at, his definition is Amos N. Wilson. And he says that from their life experiences, a group develops a set of rules and procedures for meeting their needs. The set of rules and procedures, together with a supporting set of ideas and values, is called a culture. Another known great African leader called Steve Biko also had his own definition on culture. And he says, a culture is essentially the society's complete answer to the varied problems of life. Then we have one of the most commonly cited definitions by E.B. Tyler in 1871. And Tyler says that culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, morals, religion, customs, and habits, or any other capabilities acquired by man as a member of a society. Now, which capabilities could Tyler have had in mind? Can you think of any? I will leave also this for you to discuss amongst yourselves and join your forum. And so we'll proceed to another important meeting that took place at the World Conference on Cultural Policies. And at the end of the meeting, they adopted the following definition in 1998 as a definition of culture. And the meeting said, culture is that complex whole of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features that characterize a society or social groups. It includes not only the arts and letters, but also modes of life, the fundamental rights of the human being, value systems, traditions, and beliefs. And this was in 19... 98. Amilcar Cabral also said culture simultaneously is the fruit of a people's history and the determinant of history by the positive or negative influence which it exerts on its evolution of relationships between man and his environment among man or groups of men within a society as well as among different societies. If imperialist domination has the vital need to practice cultural oppression, national liberation is necessarily an act of culture. And this was by Amilcar Cabral, 1973. Um, I will go on to give you a few more. Um, definitions and by now you're noticing that the definitions that come from different um, backgrounds from Pan-Africanists and so on and I'll give you another um, definition by Franz Fanon who was a West Indian psychoanalyst and a social philosopher and a great advocate for decolonization Franz Fanon's Definition was a national culture is the whole body of efforts made by a people in the sphere of thought to describe, justify, and praise the action through which that people has created itself and keeps itself in existence. That is by Fanon in 1963. I would suggest that you again, you Google and read more about Franz Fanon. Some aspects of culture. Let's, let's look at some aspects of culture or some aspects of life that are included 
in culture. So when we talk about culture, what does it embody? It does embody the economy of the people. And when we say the economy of the people, we're talking about their goods and services, their production, distribution, and consumption within or without their given society. Culture also includes the political systems, the society's political system, the norms and the behaviors. Some societies are identified by their political institutions and leaders. Example, the Asandis are identified by the allegiance to the golden stool, a political religious symbol, and to the Asantehini. Technology is also an aspect of culture. So when we talk about the culture of the people, we would also want to refer to their technology. And referring to the technology, we say it's the society's sciences, which are crucial to its culture. The people's tools and implements, and how these are used, are of relevance to identification of their culture. Note that by studying artifacts, archaeologists are able to identify past cultures and shed light on the pre present situation. So the society, sorry, the a society's technology and sciences are very important in the study of culture. Some other aspects of culture include entertainment. And when we talk about entertainment, it includes the music, the dance, drama, and performance. Performance is so popular and common in our daily lives and activities that some people have linked performance as the only important aspect of our culture or as the major part of our culture. So as soon as you talk about culture, our mind goes back to performance. But as we have discussed earlier, culture is not only about entertainment and performance. It is about politics, it's about your economy, it's about your technology, it's about your entertainment, and also about your language. That the language you speak is also very critical to your identity. And many ethnic groups are known by the language they speak. For example, the Nzema speak in Zema, and they are called in Zema. The Yoruba speak Yoruba, and they are called the Yoruba, and so on and so forth. So language is very important. Now, on your slides, you will see four photographs. I would like you to look at them critically and then see if these pictures fall within the domain of culture and which aspects of culture do these. And can you elaborate and justify why you think they fall within the domains of culture? Now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to discuss with you some misconceptions about development. Um, some of these misconceptions have linked development to westernization or modernization. That if you are developed or the more western you are in your approach or the more modern you are in your approach, the more developed you are. Some of the misconceptions have linked development to economic growth. That development only means economic growth. Some say development is a project or projects. Other misconceptions are that development is a definite state that some countries have attained, but others never will. Another is African culture hinders development, which I think many of, many of you have heard, and some of you may believe in it, which is untrue. And the last is to be developed means the country should have attained certain goals, such as the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, and the SGDs. So, having looked at these misconceptions, let us look at what some scholars have defined development to be. Let's look first at Matthias Sen, an economist. 
and a Nobel laureate. He says that development can be seen as a process of expanding the real freedoms that people enjoy. Focusing on human freedoms contrasts with the narrow views of development, such as identifying development with the, gro with the growth of gross national product, or with the rise of personal incomes, or with industrialization, or with technological advance, or with social modernization. Ake also says that development is a process by which people create and recreate themselves and their life circumstances to realize higher levels of civilization in accordance with their own choices and values. Now, here are a few remarks about development. After we've listened to the misconceptions about development and what some scholars have defined or explained development to mean. Here, I'd say development is a process. It continues and evolves and it doesn't stop. It should be people-oriented and should take into consideration the people whose interests are being sought. The well-being of the people should be the central issue of any development agenda. It should be about the freedoms and informed choices. The people should be able to choose what they want and how they want to achieve those. It should be also about social justice, fairness, equity, about gender equality. It should be about peace, the absence of war and conflicts. Okay, so having made these remarks about development, how does culture apply to development? It does so by promoting progressive cultural practices and rejecting destructive ones. So you would know that it is not all cultural practices that are bad or have negative impacts. There are those that are bad or can make negative contributions to society, which we must, we must make a, do away with. But those that are good and progressive, it must be incorporated into our development. It must also accommodate the people's aspirations. So our culture applies to our development when we include our aspirations in our development. Adopting, therefore adopting culturally sensitive approaches. And when we say adopting culturally sensitive approaches, we mean recognizing and exploiting culture as assets. Our norms, our knowledge, and so forth can be exploited as means to develop. So we do not develop in isolation to our culture. What we take into recognition are positive cultural values that can help us develop. Also, it is appreciating that certain cultural practices may be entrenched in our social systems. So when you are developing, you have to recognize that. And then also knowing that cultural norms are not sacrosanct and can be modified or replaced if the society needs to. So you can always change, you can always modify them, you can always change them. In conclusion, Culture does not imply absolute homogeneity, that everybody belonging to one culture must be one. We must speak alike, we must think alike, we must eat the same food, we must believe in the same God, and so on. Culture permits subcultures and intracultural differences. 
culture is created by human beings and therefore it is dynamic. It grows, it changes, it accommodates, it modifies itself and so on and it grows. Multilingualism is the norm in Africa but also unity underlies our heterogeneity of our African cultures and as we've noticed we've talked about different countries different cultures different languages we didn't talk about religion but different religious beliefs and so on different geographical and environmental conditions different food crops and so on and so forth so we are diverse but we are united as a people of Africa and of African descent African culture is the entirety of the African way of life. It is not an abstraction. Culture can be used as an important tool for development, as I have said in this lecture. And development, as it is said, is culture specific. It has to be designed for a specific cultural group or a specific people and taken into consideration their aspirations, their hope, their desires, how they want to move from point A to point B and also taken into consideration their culture. So, let me summarize this lecture. What this lecture has done is to give you an overview of the political, social, and cultural systems in Africa. It has also examined the concept of African culture or African cultures and examined the concepts of development. We have looked at the interrelationship between culture, development, and language. And having summarized these will bring us to the end of your week two of your introduction to African studies. But before I end, let me just ask one question, which I believe you will take time to explore and to read about it and try to answer it again you can discuss this in your forum. And the question is, how can we make sense of the concept of a Ghanaian culture, given the diversity of ethnic groups present in Ghana today? Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best in the subsequent lectures in African Studies. Thank you, and see you sometime later. Bye-bye.